So I'm starting. Mm, okay, so I'm really happy that uh, we are here together and I would like to welcome you uh, on a meeting around uh, the distributed power model. And so we will be reflecting on uh, what does it mean to share power and responsibilities in organizations and how to build more equal and resilient workplaces where we can thrive as human beings and show ourselves fully. Uh, my name is Alexandra Yach. I'm a member of uh, uh, Teal Breakfasts. This is a grassroots uh, initiative in Poland devoted to popularizing ideas of teal. Uh, and I have a pleasure to introduce our guests today and to moderate uh, our discussions in general. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say that I came across Alicia's and Troll's work half a year ago. Uh, mm, I read the book they wrote together. We will be referring to this book uh, mm, today. Uh, and to me, um, this is this publication is a wonderful introduction to the world of Teal. Uh, full of uh, inspiring tools, but also um, uh, uh, concrete cases from their field work. Um, and uh, it helped me a lot like to read this book and um, gather knowledge from it, uh, because sometimes I hear Mm, from business people that uh, Teal is wonderful, but and and uh, the values around this approach is very, you know, um, what they how how they would like to see their work. At the same time, they they um, they are saying that this is utopia, uh, and uh, you know, within cost constraints we have in neoliberal economy, you cannot run the business this way in, a, in an ineffective way. So in this book, I found uh, examples of different companies they are, that exist and they are teal companies or, or they follow values that I related that are related to teal. And they not only like exist, but they develop they, and they achieve uh, uh, good results, yeah, good outcomes. So uh, they're not uh, unicorns. Uh, uh, this movement is uh, wider and wider. And I would like to introduce our guests. Um, Alicia Medina is a Swedish doctor of philosophy and management. Uh, she spent 20 years in corporations like Ericsson, AstraZeneca, Sony Mobile, IKEA, and some con consultancy firms in technical and management positions. Uh, and until uh, 2021, uh, she worked part-time at Umia uh, University in Sweden and was a visiting lecturer at Schema in France. Also as at uh, Universidad de Monte Montevideo in Uruguay. Uh, Rolf Medina is uh, as well Swedish doctor of philosophy and management. He worked professionally in different uh, technological areas, uh, uh, also on uh, management positions. Uh, 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 he was working at Ericsson, uh, or, um, GN Resounds, uh, uh, Scanner Traffic and Sony Mobile, uh, Vattenfall and IKEA, also as a, a consultant. Uh, and he is also a lecturer and researcher uh, at the School of Economics at UMIA, University in Sweden, uh, Schema in France, uh, UCL in London. Um, and they together, they are founders of uh, Future of Organizing. Um, uh, and in this uh, initiative company, they focus on uh, supporting companies how to move to new organizing paradigm. And they wrote together a book, uh, Teal Trust Transparency, which you see on the background of uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, when you look at our guests. Uh, um, yeah, and this is this is practical guide of how to organize uh, uh, and lead based on teal. So uh, hello, and it's uh, great to have you here. Uh, I will um, tell you a few words about uh, general agenda for our meeting. So we will start with this, you know, explaining uh, what does mean this the model, what, what is behind this uh, name, the distribution, distributed power model. Um, then our guests will uh, share few uh, stories from their fieldwork. Uh, and uh, after that, we will dive into uh, group work with a question or questions, if we will have more time, related to the uh, first chapter of the book around people um, who are, uh, you know, uh, like this chapter is like um, really important uh, foundation for thinking about uh, uh, teal organizations, like people are the most important. Yeah. So uh, we can start, I think. Um, Rolf and uh, Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. A very nice presentation, introduction. Uh, yes, we are we are running a company called Future Organizing that, you, as you said, um, that we made this support organization with leadership, organizing and collaboration. This is all about to increase the employee and, uh, engagement to be more work more efficient, more agile and dynamic, and not at least more profitable. Uh, and we see we also have a perspective. We see uh, an organization of today that mainly consists of people, relationships, and working tasks. We have our distributed power model that we describe now in in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we use that to assess and analyze an organization to see what kind of activities and that are needed to unleash their potential in the organization, or also to start a journey to the utilization of the full potential. But maybe you can start to describe the DP model, Alicia. Yes. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the invitation of being here. It is very nice to be here. This is part of our purpose to spread this knowledge about TEAL. And before I start explaining the model, I would like to say just a few words about the background, how this everything started. We were facing like it was said in the introduction, that we were meeting different people, different companies, people from different business that they were thinking whatever it have to do with steel or sociocracy or, or any other of this new way of organizing. It was something that it was nice, but it was always like a kind of barrier saying that, what is this? This is not possible. Uh, this doesn't apply for us that we work in retail, or this um, is only for small companies, or this is uh, only for uh, uh, new companies. There was always kind of excuse for saying that why this is not possible. Uh, then we decided that, yeah, we need to do something um, to really show that it is possible. And uh, we already knew there were a lot of examples around that. And we also wanted to do a different kind of research. The research we were doing by being associate professors of this university, it was publishing these boring um, articles in, 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 in um, scientific journals. And nobody reads those articles because nobody understands it. It is just something that I don't know why researchers do this. But uh, we wanted really to do something that could apply for many, many people and everybody could understand. And that's, that's why we started this research project. From the beginning, was thinking to be, um, the plan was to be two years, then it came the pandemic and it was extended to three years. Uh, during that time, we have the possibility to, to study quite in deep about 100 companies and interview more than 350 something people. 
uh, at different levels and at different things. And also having the amazing opportunity to uh, interview and to have good conversations with the people that are really the more important in the field uh, and really have done it. And uh, why why the, the name, why we call it this distributed power? It's because we were also looking for what was the common, the common denominator of all those companies that we were seeing that they were successful, they were working in another way, they were being very uh, people centric and this thing. And what was the 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 main thing? It is it was this the distribution of power. Uh, so that's why the name is uh, a DP model that's there for distribution of power. During this research also, we found that there was there are 12 different areas. We talk about um, a model and a, an approach that it is really systemic, that you need to be, see everything. And uh, we have 12 different areas and those areas need to be they are connecting to each other. Working with one of them will also affect the others. And we see also this as a kind of an instrument of how to come to an organization and analyze where we are, where we want to be, uh, but also to start these conversations because otherwise people were also asking, okay, what is TEAL? What do we need to do to be TEAL? So by working uh, uh, with those areas that, that give this kind of support, uh, that's why the book is more like a guide. And uh, uh, one of the areas, it is people, it is the first one, the one that we consider really, really very important because in organizations, really what is there is in organization, the more valuable thing there are people. So we need really to take care of the people that are in the organization, but to take care also in a different way. And that's why the part that have to do with the psychological safety is very important. And a lot of things starts there. And with that, what I mean to say, it is not only the relationship between the manager and the people, it is also about the relationship between teams and between people. So a lot of things that have to do with these social interactions and this thing have to do with people. Um, also, like every th other things that, that are in life, and especially when you talk about something that is systemic, it is about balance, having this balance between working life and well-being and different things. And people to, in order to, people need to be engaged and in order to be engaged they need to be specific things need to happen around them it is not only the nature of the work we are going to talk more about this area that is people today the other area is culture and we can say that like i say those areas are always related to each other there is a lot of relation with uh, people but this is more as a as a collective thing when we talk about people, it is more people itself. Uh, when we talk about culture, culture, what is culture and what is the organizational culture? And the organizational culture is not at all whatever is written in different walls with different things. We are this, we are that. It's, it's just entering when organization and culture is something that you can feel it. You can smell it, you can see, because it's the way people do things. What is possible here? What are the norms? What people celebrate? What is accepted, not accepted? And regarding culture, it is the question of creating a culture of um, inclusion, of diversity, of um, some kind of respect for each other. And uh, also, uh, accepting things what they are and having some kind of common values that they be really is the way the way we do things really reflect those values and uh, yeah that was about culture the third area is organizing and we are not calling it organization we call it organizing because its focus is organizing work it's not about creating an organogram with uh, role descriptions is not organizing people, it's organizing work. That's a huge difference because organizing people is going to be creating this hierarchical structure with power and, and levels. It's not a problem with hierarchy, hierarchies, 
because this is a structure of work. Um, but organizing work is includes like what kind of unit circles, um, the forums, type of work, how do we cooperate with each other, how we have the kind of roles do we have, governance systems, how can we be an efficient organization, uh, a dynamic organization. We will move away from the hierarchy of power to a more dynamic way of, uh, our, of organizing work. And we are promoting self-organization. Um, why self-organization? The difference from before, uh, when we have this more command and control world or the industrial era where we have managers, introduction, deciding who we're going to do what, giving instructions. We're not working like that anymore because people who are doing the job, they know most about the job, about the work. So the most nat natural way for them is to organize the way they're going to work. So that is a, that's the reason that self-organizing is a natural part of today's way of working. Uh, and of course, within that area of responsibility. The fourth area in the DP model is leadership. And that we, we, can, we can talk about leadership for hours because that is something, there's a lot of definition about uh, leadership. We will. We are trying to go from a manager role being above a team to a leader being a part of a team. And also that almost everyone can be can be a, a leader or working with leadership, especially in self-organizing. Um, so everyone practice some kind of leadership depending on competence situation. And we also see that that uh, a leader of today have to balance the human, the people approach with the structure process. Because if you're going to be a part of a team, you have to understand the way of working, methods to make decisions, et cetera, but also understand people. So a leader of today should be reflecting, able to learn, to feel, but also to be a part of the work. Uh, so trying to move away from bosses into leaders for people that can lead. And you have to be more like kind of things like authenticity, empathy, trust, humbleness, and also to use that kind of uh, approach to be in a leading role. The fifth area is decision making. And um, it's actually an area where we, in most cases, start with uh, when we are supporting organization, but because decision making is something that it's easy to improve. Um, for us, it includes some kind of decision mechanism, like, like classification or categorization of different kind of decisions. Are they operational? Are they tactical or developing or are they strategic? to understand that what kind of method do we use to, to make those decisions. Uh, also, who are going to be involved in the decisions? And uh, the approach we have that is the one who has knowledge in the area should be a part of the decision. And if possible, the people are going to be affected on the decision. And also that a lot of the operational decisions should be made in front line of, about, about uh, about the people who can work in with the area and maybe can use some kind of advice process or something else. Uh, so decision-making is something that is very close to organizing a leadership. I'll also try to include people in that to, to be able to make a decision process more efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sixth area, Alicia, so the next area, it's about <clears throat> transparency and communication. It is an area that have two sides and it's really connected to trust because whatever you want to build in organization, it is really important to have this trust and uh, really reflect of all those things, why there are so many things in many organizations that need to be 
confidential or strictly confidential and this thing. And when we go inside the organization and help them, that we see that 99.9 of the decisions is something that there is no, no reason for, for having these things. So transparency is really important to create this environment of, of, of safety, but also to involve people in many things. And when we think about transparency, we are also thinking about being transparent about the intentions. It's not only being transparent that what is it in many companies, especially these big corporates that we have been working with for many years, they think that once all the decisions are done, they have these big meetings and they inform everyone. And that is, wow, why transparent? What transparent I am? I am telling everybody. And everybody is getting the news at the same time. That is very important. Uh, but this is not, uh, transparency is something else. It's, first of all, it is also being about the intention. Sometimes we don't know. It is just a question that something is going on. And that could be the, enough thing to communicate. Something is going on. We are thinking about something. So <clears throat> transparency is, is really one of the keys of this thing and is connected to trust. Uh, when it comes to communication, it is really important the way we did we do feedback. And uh, if we consider the, the, the old way of giving feedback, it was our coming to a manager and he's going to tell you all the things you didn't did well and maybe they just to make the things a little better, they start with something this you did not. This was horrible, and but at the end you are still okay in this method that we call this sandwich method. Uh, this is also a method that doesn't work, doesn't make people to be creative, doesn't make people to develop. It needs to be a completely different way of giving feedback that it is really focused on future. Whatever happened, happens. But uh, having a kind of uh, joint reflection about what can be done to make the future different. Uh, and the other area that is also important and also is, is mentioned in, in uh, Laluc's book, Reinventing Organization, but we have developed it even further. It is about um, salary models and uh, profit sharing. And with that, we mean there needs to be a kind of a balance in the salaries. The organization needs to start thinking what is the difference between the person in the organization that earned more and the one that have less, how many times more? Uh, is it okay that we have uh, somebody in the organization that is earning 20 times more than somebody else? And what are the reasons for that? And uh, in all this new way of working, this new paradigm, it goes from two and a half to five times more, what it is considered to be a uh, proper um, equilibrium. Uh, the other thing is also going away from having these personal individual bonuses or compensations because this is, doesn't help the organization itself. It makes people to be more individualist instead of working together. And this also is connecting to how we see people. If all Independent, we will do work and the work have requires different kind of competences and maybe also education and might be a huge difference between that. But somehow everybody is contributing to the organization and that needs to be also reflected at the time of having these um, compensations. And in this new paradigm, it is also there are several models, many organizations, they work and they find it themselves, what will be the new way of setting salaries by having some kind of procedures that the people um, present it by themselves. And then they have kind of a peer review, people working around you also will give the feedback. It's also moving away from having a manager that maybe haven't seen at all what people have done, being the one that will set the salary or by doing it just by saying, okay, your code is this one, and because of that, you will get um, this much money. Um, and then the other area also, um, it is this digital uh, tools and technology. And it's more an area that it is a kind of an enabler, but if you don't have that, it is really difficult because 
to to be able to distribute this power, distribute um, responsibilities and everything in the organizations, it needs to be something that facilitates that, that make it possible. Uh, <clears throat> And the way we communicate or when we want to make decisions by having using some kind of methods like this um, um, uh, counseling uh, um, process and this thing, you need to have an easy way to interact with people because otherwise this self-organizing uh, will take too much time. So technology is there just to help us to make it possible and there are many examples in the book that really shows how with the help of the technology it has been possible for them to um, make this change mm -hmm. and technology is continuously changing so we what happened in the book written two years ago there is a lot of new technology today so that will continue to grow and grow and change. Uh, this was eight areas. We have 12 in total. And the ninth is competence and learning. What's competence? Uh, competence is uh, the ability to use knowledge, experience, and skills in order to achieve some kind of result. What is happening now that the, everything is more and more knowledge intensive, that you have to learn new things much faster. Then we actually move from knowledge being being important. Knowledge is like what many people call hard skills. Things say yeah, can you, you can study, you can learn to practice. And then moving into the more important part is your abilities to use the knowledge, how you can improve your behaviors, your, self, your way of working with things. And um, so that is more important in the future. And then we have to move away from roles and positions into to working with competence and competence is more important than than role description or work descriptions I, i'm contributing with my competence not in my role it's very include it's very important and we also have to build in 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 organization that we continuously learn new things that learning is a part of the work it's not something we do beside the work you're not going to a course and then you, this is learning learning is when we are trying testing doing doing things is when we learn so this has to be built in as a natural part of work uh, so we have to work in this way with, with competence and learning and competence and learning is maybe is is a core part of an organization today to be ordered to be successful in long term. The 10th area in a distributed power model is workplaces and working hours. And that is something that is very current today. And um, the pandemic changed a lot of the view of the workplace and the working hours. We have actually four different ways to look at this. We have work to have to be done at a specific time, a specific place. We have to work to have to be done at a specific place, independent of the time. We have to have we have work that have to be in a specific place independent of time. And then we have work that can be done whenever, wherever, however. And the last part is growing. The work we can do uh, the independent of place and time. But in the same time, we have to be able to that more and more work, we have to collaborate, collaborate with people. So we have also to have the view of how do we meet especially in office office work and we are seeing today that we are moving away for office work being at the office we are going into my hybrid way of working working from different places and there we have the connection to the leadership Here we have leaders that can adapt to the new situation so that is a really really important part today we're also discussing working hours. There is uh, many countries, in, especially in Europe, but also in the world, discussing this four days a week that we are going to move from five working five days to over four days. In Sweden, they introduced five, uh, 40 hours per week, 1919, more than 100 years ago. Then they worked six hours per, per week, but uh, six days per week. 
And uh, I think in Sweden has 1971, we, they have a five days week in, by law. It's many years ago. So maybe we have to consider work in a different way today. And the other thing that's more a philosophical question is, when do we work? When we work with knowledge, we cannot turn off my brain. I'm working when I'm home cooking or I'm not working. So maybe we have also a tradition to, to measure the work by time, but maybe we have to consider to move in to, 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 to measure by achievements, but it's not easy. It's not easy. The easy way is to, to measure work by time. Uh, two areas left. You have social responsibility, sustainability. Um, an organization is a part of the society. It's not an isolated part. People are also a part of society, but also a part of an organization. So we have to consider that. So we have to support people or encourage people to, to have social engagement. An organization has to be a part and support the society. And we have to, to see that so we have kind of circular economy, social responsibility, have a more longer view of how can we support it our society, our planet, that is very current today. Um, so, and this also considered the whole value chain. When we're working. The last one is finance. And um, in many models or frameworks about teal self-organizing of the governance systems, they're not considering Finance, because say if you are a, if you have a higher purpose, everything everything will come by that, the money will come by that. We don't really believe in that. Uh, we have to be financially healthy over time, not short term profit, but profit over time. Otherwise, otherwise we will disappear from the market. But we have to to consider who are we doing business with who are our suppliers, who are our customers, um, are they aligned with our values, principles, and the purpose of organization. It's also connected to the salary models. Are we fair to our, to our employees? So that is something we have to consider. So that is a 12 area of, uh, of the deep model. And I'm going to just share us short picture of it so because we have uh, we have the 12 areas we say that is also on the purpose of the organization and principles and we see it as some some kind of kaleidoscope that because they are connected to each other these 12 areas so if you turn it around, you can see a new way. So if you work, start to work in the leadership, it will impact on organizing, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the distributed power model. And we will, in the book, we're displaying government systems, et cetera. We can have sociocracy, for instance, that to say it cover uh, organizing and decision-making. It's not covering people and, and uh, social responsibility, so things like that. I'll stop sharing again. Um, that was actually the way we are looking at the distributed power model. And seeing this distributed power as a kaleidoscope is also it keeps this thing that every organization, it is unique. It is not a question of copying from somebody else and say, I will get the same. That's why also we have this metaphor. And today we are going to present two of the examples from the field uh, that are quite different. And just, just to, to, to give something very concrete and see how different it can be. I will start with one example that we also described in the book. And that is quite old. It is an example of, of a case from uh, 1990. 
Uh, and the reason for that also is that we want also to show that this is not something that is completely new, something that is it didn't exist before, and it started after Lalos have written his book. That is not the case. Um, it is about a company that the name is Stutzwick. It was um, founded in 1947, and the purpose was to construct experimental reactors and uh, develop different kind of methods for extracting uranium. Uh, from the different Swedish deposit. And the company was uh, moving the direction more and more to start supplying services for the nuclear power industry. The beginning of 1990, it was little more, more than 1,000 employees working there, but it was really uh, in a very bad shape when it came to finances. It had been unprofitable for many, many years. And uh, since it was a public company, uh, always the government needs to come in and, and, and help them with money. And a part of that company also was having a very bad reputation in the media and have a bad management. And it happened many things and the staff didn't feel well. Um, they were not having a good faith in the future. And uh, a lot of people were on sick leave. And it was something that people were like feeling a shame of saying, I'm working for Stutzwick. The average age of the employees was the 53. And uh, for them, the opportunities to get new jobs were not that big because uh, they were really, really highly educated people, but they have a very specific and specialized skills that uh, at that moment, and I could say even today, it was not uh, required in other industries. Then uh, it comes what, what it became the, really the, the change of everything. In 1990, Toy Bishibikas, that was an associate professor in physics, was recruited as a CEO, and they gave him the assignment to liquidate the company just to close it down. And he started his assignment by doing that. Once he entered the company there and he saw the skills that were there, he could see all the potential that was in there. And with his leadership style, having this uh, humanistic approach, uh, he really managed to uh, change the situation that they have from being really a declining company into successful business. And the first thing he did, it was just in six months. It was amazing. So he moved off from having a, um, a, a loss of 50 million Swedish crowns to a profit of six uh, million crowns. And then it continues and continues. And the question is, what did he? How was it possible? What was the things? Was something magic? And it was not. The answer is very simple. He was thinking that there was it was a need of a different leadership. Uh, he was as a person somebody that really believed in people, and uh, he had some kind of um, that they need to have the power. So he started doing this distribution of power when it comes to decisions. And uh, he understood that this is not, not need to be by higher managers. And when we ask him, and we have been interviewing him several times and seeing his work and this thing, he have six different um, points that things that kind of insight um, how to, to manage that. And the first one was considering that the staff is really the company most valuable asset. The second is that the staff really have a knowledge. The third is that they have the ability. Fourth is that they really want to do good work. The fifth is that realize that the staff not always are given the opportunity to show that they are really capable of. And the last one was to 
create insight and consensus and give the staff the opportunity to show what they really were capable of. So he decided together with some of the people, some kind of principles, what we can do with all the things that we have here, that everything is a mess and it is just not giving profit. What can we do? What kind of service we can do within those things that we know that the quality will be okay. We are going to maintain whatever we offer. And uh, there was a series of criteria. And then the ideas started to come. He really opened up for this the collective intelligence. He really distributed the power and there were the people that um, were coming with the ideas. And the only check they were doing, it was always checking against the principles that they have decided at the beginning. That was the only thing that could say, this idea is accepted, this is not, very of that. And his approach was really a create, is really a, a completely culture, a culture of participation. And when he considered that he, as a leader also, he was giving trust to people and he was willing to take risks. He had the courage because that is also one of the things that uh, we need. And start controlling others and following up on the work of others. And the result of that is that Stuttgart was really transformed into a fantastic company where innovation really took off and created really positive headlines all around the world from Stuttgart, the, it became new companies that they were sold to different places. And it is a company that is exists even today. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is um, an amazing example. Uh, yes, and I actually, I, in, the, in the 1990s, I lived just 50 kilometers from, from Stutzwick. Um, there was a lot of discussion about this company at that moment. So that was a really, really uh, specific uh, case. You know, in the 1950s, Sweden tried to develop nuclear weapons at that place. That was another time, another context. Everyone was fighting for to have nuclear weapons after the Second World War. But another story. I will have a second example. It's more a current example. It's not described in the book. It's uh, a company that we work with this year, actually. Um, it's a com it's a company here in in Sweden in the south of Sweden that produces like a technical products and solutions, and um, they also invest a lot in in research and development. They have grown fast, and we continue to grow because they are in a market that is really really good, and they are growing and more than the market as well. They came, they came to us with a, they have a dilemma because how could they grow without, without uh, creating more hierarchies, more levels in the organization? We uh, understood that more levels in the hierarchy should lead to more ways, more administration, lack of transparency and communication. They're like, they have a lot of silos already. So they want, how can we do, how can we be more dynamic? They have a traditional way of looking at, we have one manager, 10 subordinates, director reporting people. Um, so they have this, this kind of situation. We start with some interviews that we always do uh, to understand the current situation and we, you understood very, very, very fast that the management team, they need to think differently, differently about the manager role and how to act as a leader. Um, another issue we saw very fast, it was, this is a really common problem when you're using this kind of agenda, methodology like Scrum, et cetera. It's the team, they were too autonomous. In, like, they're meaning a low level of trans, uh, transparency, or communication between the teams. And there's a lot of non-managed dependencies. So they were like the teams are really homogen, not communicating so much with each other. So that was this kind of two problems is so very fast. We conducted a workshop with the management team to start like this collective reflection about where they were, how they could how they could think differently. 
and also in trying to introduce this distributed power model for them. So um, how they, so they could have a way to have a more systemic view of the organization and how they can also think about that the manager not have a distance to the to the team or to the teams. So we worked with them to see in the workshop, how can we move from a manager to a leader being a part of the team from responsibility to ownership. Uh, we have talked a lot of ownership, R responsibility you get from above. Ownership you feel, that the team can feel ownership of this area. We also uh, work with um, how it's possible to distribute task, management tasks to the team. How can we work with contribution in our competence instead of the role? So I'm not in this team based on my position. I'm not here for to be a Ludesis manager. I'm here because I have a competence and knowledge in different areas. Um, and this is a typical middle manager issues because how can we think differently? I'm not the manager, I have my subordinates. The next step we did with them, uh, the management team to us to, to uh, have some areas to reflect about. So we picked three areas from the distributed power model, leadership, organizing, decision-making. Uh, we sent them some questions they have to reflect to discuss about this, like which of the management task could be distributed within the team? Who in the team has the leadership qualities? What can be done to make the team members to feel ownership? Uh, is it possible to generate roles where competence decides who are going to take a specific task and not the role? Will it possibly transform any static organizational uh, entities into more dynamic circles to be more dynamic in, in a way? Uh, how can you test one person in many roles because you have one person, one role in this organization. So instead of contributing in different parts, you can, can we think differently here? Uh, do everyone in the organization understand the difference between a strategical, tactical development or an operational decision? It's possible to start some kind of advice process or participation process. Can we start a consent as a method? They were not uh, supposed to start the work of this areas. Just to, the purpose of this question was for them to, to reflect, can we do this? Can we work differently in, in the role as a manager? Um, also to, to them to together to act as a team and change the way moving from the manager role and maybe try to create a more dynamic organization so they can start to, to grow this organization without adding more layers or more managers. Um, this first step was to change the view of the manager role. And then the next step was to work with the teams because the middle management have to start to change the way of thinking before we can go in in the teams to start working with them. Otherwise, it will need will not be a good way to approach it. Ourselves, we, we, cannot, we cannot manage the change for them to this transition. They have to do it themselves, but we can act what we call companions and support in this. So we're supporting the people. We are not managing it. So we are supporting. So this is a way to start. We can start with easy things like decision making. So we can have to, we can use and have a methodology to make decisions, but and then we'll, yeah, we will uh, come to some kind of improvement. But before we have taken more steps into this, where you work, where you're thinking together, who you're going to be involved, etc., we will not have a real full potential of of the um, of the case of the work. So that was an old case described in the book, a new case that we are like, how can we start to work with an organization to to have this kind of dilemma? How to to uh, how to grow without add more levels in the in the hierarchy. 
So that was two cases from the field. And uh, I don't know, Ola, shall we sum up, sum up with some questions or? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for uh, this wonderful introduction to the model and um, sharing this uh, uh, cases from your field work. Um, yeah, I think that this would be good uh, uh, moment to uh, gather some questions or comments. Uh, um, I've seen on the chat that you were, you know, commenting. Uh, uh, sy synchronously uh, when our guests were speaking and uh, um, there was, was one question around um, happiness KPI or something similar do you do you describe uh, uh, mm. any kind of tools as that in the book mm. uh, we explain in the book we have something that what we call this well-being because this is what we say when we want to see is also moving from the way we have now that everything is um, based in how much we produce, how much money or how many things or how many units or how many new markets we have taken on these things to have this what we call this well-being um, KPI. And it is really connected to the, the part that have to do with people about this balance between life, work, well-being, um, possibility of feeling that I can go to work and uh, the whole of me can go to work. It is not something that I need to put a kind of specific clothes vest or a mask uh, to go to the work. So yes, we think it's very important and we mention it in the book. Uh, and this also have the connection to this when we talk about these different digital tools and technologies. There are some uh, tools and they are coming all the time for measuring that. Um, some are good, better than others, but uh, there are a lot of things there. There are also tools that uh, they measure the engagement and they measure different things. And even those tools that we are not very fond of this because we don't think, we don't see exactly what is behind that, what is the research or something, we still consider that just having the conversation and using them can help uh, organizations because it's a way of saying this is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can add there is a tool that is very very popular in Sweden. Uh, I can't remember the name, but it's like an app for the managers to measure the, the uh, subordinates uh, engagement. So they get getting so the, the the employees they're getting a lot of messages that they have to answer how I'm I'm feeling today and things like that. And this is like I think there is a it's very popular today to measure everything. If I bought something on the internet, I get a response. How do you feel about the uh, about uh, the service? I'm going to the bank and doing things. How, how do you think like it is? So, so we are we are like everything. We have to measure everything. And but the, the purpose is what? What? How are we measuring it? How are we going to use it for? Uh, exactly. And uh, when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about you know um, this that this is one direction. Sometimes, yeah, that uh, these measurements are going into one direction only. So, so the group who is measured don't know what the other side is, uh, I don't know, uh, doing or this is one thing. And another is about, you know, implementing the knowledge from this, the, the data. Yes. Yeah? So what we are doing with that, because it's not it's super frustrating when you gather you know, all this information and the change is not coming, yeah? So the, it's not, you know, the yeah. manager yeah. You see are not respecting the, you know, the needs of uh, employees, they, yeah. Mm -hmm. When I when I say, when I was talking about um, uh, transparency and communication, and I say also we need to communicate sometimes the intentions, this is an example, <laughs> because sometimes when, 
if something is implemented, it needs to be communicated and in a way that everybody understands what is the intention, what are we going to do with this information, what this will, in which way it will contribute to the organization, the team, or maybe the uh, development of people. Exactly. Wukash is about... Just to summarize that. So a, a well-implemented well-being or happiness KPI is super. Yeah. Uh, so... But it has to be implemented in a in a good way that everyone understands what is going to be used. Ukash is asking about how to search for such a companies uh, uh, who I don't know, like who were described as as assumed uh, by you. Uh, yeah, so maybe I, I don't know, Ukash, if you want to give more context for your question, so maybe it would be uh, easier to answer. Yeah, I mean, companies that are going in the direction of teal, they are already teal, so where to look for them? Hmm. Or maybe how? Can you ask that, Alicia? Uh, I think we, we can, uh, later we can send uh, some list of some of the tools or companies that we know they are working with that and we consider them better. Otherwise, the way of uh, looking for them is to start looking about uh, for companies that are measuring employee engagement, measuring this um, happiness. Uh, there is a whole movement in the UK that is the um, happiness, what is the name? Uh, happiness something. And um, then there are many others that it goes more to the psychological part and then you will start looking about uh, uh, well-being uh, stress um, psychological anxiety because some people are measuring that so I mean start looking for tools based on those kind of things but we can send just a we have short... we have a movement in Spain for instance that's a lot of companies that we that are really into this uh, yeah. is also what is the definition of teal uh, more like they are working a progressive way with improving mm -hmm. having a self organization as a base so and we are, it's fantastic we were in, in Argentina last year and we met a company there in Argentina and this is a context of very very much a corrupt uh, very very a lot of hierarchies everything and they were so teal it was a tealish. It is they have a transparency in, in several ways. They're just doing business with companies to trust. They're not taking uh, money under the table. I forget that. So they and they are growing and have been there for 12 years. Name is 10 pines. So you can find them everywhere in the world in the most strange contexts. Argentina is you know it's not natural to work like this. In Brazil, there's a lot of companies working with teal. So we, as Alisa said, we can we can send you a number of companies on how to, to find them. We have mentioned a lot, several in the book as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. There are more questions here. Uh, um, Martin, can you ask your question uh, by yourself? Because it's quite like uh, long and I, I I would like to you know, catch yes, of course. Um, uh, sorry, I cannot turn on my camera, so I will be um, only, you'll be hearing only my voice. I was wondering how is it in Sweden? Because uh, from what I hear, from what I see in Poland, well-being is very often boiled down to having fruit Fridays, free lunches for workers, etc. And it is not bad in my opinion. However, uh, I think that if you want a genuine uh, well-being, start with something like empathic body conversation, start with something like mindful and empathic listening to one another. And I would like to have some uh, clue how it's in Sweden or other countries, if you may refer to them. I can answer that. Uh, we usually get this question about Sweden. And many people think that uh, but in Sweden, uh, almost many companies uh, must be teal or they are already there. And 
that is the perception that other people uh, outside Sweden have. Uh, I could say, first of all, that is not the case. That was also one of the triggers when we started our investigation, because we saw what had been fantastic with the Swedish management model uh, that was from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s. Uh, being the companies very democratic, consider people trying to not have a hierarchy that was so high. These things have changed. Uh, <clears throat> but the, what is the reason of that? The first thing, because before I answer directly to the question, I want to put this context. Sweden has been a very good democracy as a country. So, of course, if you have a country that has very, very well developed democratic way of being, that will be reflected in the organizations because the organizations are part of the company. On the other side, if we see examples like we were saying 10 pines in Argentina, you cannot say that the country has very well democratic crowns or something, but there is something different in the culture of the people. And since everything starts with people, you know, this going to the work because they are the people that you like to be work uh, to work with, and somehow there is a kind of love to other people, and people have another way of accepting each other and this thing. In those countries, you might find that the well-being it is better just because independently or what happened around, and even in Spain, Spain, this movement of tilt organization is going so fast that there we can find the absolutely best examples in the world. And when it comes to specific things, it's like many other things, this having fruits and having all those things, this is cosmetic. This is something that, okay, yeah, is better than nothing, but it's not about that. Uh, there is a comparison also, what are the values? The values, like I say, they are not different slogans that you will write in a world, it's the, the way you act. And the same in things is here. And we have seen several organizations that are really upfront those things in Sweden. Um, one of them is IKEA, where we have worked a lot with, and they really are putting those things like uh, some kind of mindfulness, um, uh, training and um, trying to make people to be aware of those things before going to a meeting uh, where we are going to to make important decisions in which mood mentally we are before we enter there uh, and also to have different kind of training or or workshops and this thing that really allows people to understand that part also that everything doesn't need to be logic and but even there it needs to be a balance because there maybe you can take over Rolf. we have seen here that there is also here in sweden a tendency of many um companies especially some um, consultancy companies that are too focusing too much in this in a development that they forget the other, but uh... yeah, they forget that they forget what are going to be done because work is also work is important, not in, just in the development of, of a person. Uh, going to back to Sweden, we can see in Sweden there's a lot. If you go to La Luz color scale, there's a lot of green companies in Sweden, culture driven, mm -hmm. but they are not. There is a problem with cult with culture driven companies that. They're putting too much effort in 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 culture in not in in uh, people how they are feeling actually they are trying to work with the own the culture and um, there are also there was there is still what to say non official managers in those kind of campus people that impact a lot um, so that is the situation these fruit Fridays fruits everything that have started. 25 years ago in Sweden, I think, starting with that. And uh, there is companies are moving into more taking care of the of the people. But this, as Lisa said, it's not natural in, in the Swedish culture to do that because we are we always have a distance to each other. Work is work and private life is private life. We not mix that so much. And and that impact to so go to back to Maralisia is born in Uruguay, for instance, as really collective. Uh, country that they're taking care of each, each other, a natural part of the culture. Mm. 
An example from Uruguay, you were talking about this Fruit Fridays. One of my best friends from my childhood, he works in a bank. They have these Whiskey Fridays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two o'clock, they stop everything and they start to drink whiskey. Yeah, that is, this is true. <laughs> Only men, not women. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think in Poland we are also um, very. We could be also very creative in uh, in inventing <laughs> local rituals. Yeah, but yeah. it's great that you are talking about this cultural background. Yeah. Uh, how, how important is that for, you know, for this kind of work you are doing and part of us here are doing? Yeah, that's uh, you know everywhere is you know you have to work with culture like in general. It's not only about organizational culture yes yeah? also about how uh, one of the people here said I, I think it was uh, marching that you know education for example in Poland is still very hier hier hierarchical in the sense that kids are trained in um, in submissive like behaviors yes yeah? so it's not really a surprise that when they uh, go to work they they just repeat this kind of uh, way of being yeah of course it changed a lot and there are different educational movements here in Poland and it's great but still the mainstream the mainstream is like that um, uh, there is a question from Paulina uh, about uh, the interests uh, for your model uh, from uh, management schools uh, uh, um, be, yeah, your lectures also. So yeah, you have a close uh, relation with students and universities. So how you work with like with that? Uh, university in general are very conservative. Um, they are also like I said, they are also teaching old method methods to do things. This is one of the reasons that we are. We are um, we are introducing old methods to young people, so they are going out in the in the organization and using and thinking that making a career is my is my goal in life. If I climb the career steps, we are um, earning more money. Uh, there is an interest, there's a huge interest, especially by students. Mm -hmm. um, but they also, I also understand why why university are conservative because there is a process to introduce new material, new way of doing uh, the courses, everything is a, is a process that takes time for that. And But there is an interest um, that I hope the interest move into action. I don't know think, what, what do you think, Alicia? Yeah. <clears throat> In Sweden, we have something that I say always, something that is very good, sometimes it tends to be a little bad. We have only in Sweden, the only thing we have it is public universities, and they are really steered by the, the, the government. And it needs to have the process are very rigid in a way. So even changing uh, what is the literature that is going to be in a course, it might take several years. So when it comes to this, Sweden is not the best example. Things that we have been doing in France and, and I was doing in Uruguay and Rolf was also doing in, in um, uh, UK, they were for private universities and they are always, you know, looking for new things. Here in Sweden, we have been able, of course, to talk to our students and mention these things and uh, being also as a yes lecturers and, and just talking about that. But we have not been able to manage that this will be part of the main thing when people are studying, for example, a master in organizational or organizational development or something. They are still in those universities teaching old methods. And uh, that is one of the reasons also what we have been, we are not working for university anymore. I, we have completely stopped working with them because this was a kind of frustration. And even though we were trying to find every small open part to try and to take it out, it is, yeah, it was not so easy. So that's why I say on one side, it is fantastic that we only have this public university that give a lot of, opportunities to everyone and it gives it will be the same education and things you can compare but since it is so regulated it takes time but young people are really really very 
interested in this way because even though they have gone to school and they have informed in another way, the majority of them, they have this uh, tendency, this willingness to use whatever they want and they want to be more autonomous, more independent because I think even they have come to the same kind of education when they were child it has been a little more open that when they have uh, been educated i have an example uh two years ago three years ago i was when i worked at ucl in london we have um i was in the management uh, i have a modular about supply chain management management and i have anna l who is the was the ceo of Svenska Auto system that is mentioned in the book she was supposed to talk about sustainability because they were working uh circular economy and then she mentioned that how they were organized in there and and this was an international class with people from taiwan in the east to chile in in, in the sorry in the west and east chile in the east and then all the question was about, about organizing leadership how do you work how are everything working so all the questions and there were like 50 50 students or something in the class so that's an example, and everyone from from China to Chile were interested in this way of thinking. Instead, not so much into the sustainability, actually. Uh, so that was an example. Sorry. Next. Yes. So, so did you like Martin is asking? Did you thought about your own management school? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not that easy, no. <laughs> uh, it's not that easy to. Um, there are a couple of people here in, in that we have in in contact with that want to start some kind of teal schools in different countries. So there is people who want to do that, and uh, mm -hmm. so I think there maybe would be something uh, if we are part of, part of that. I don't know, but that's another story. Yeah, let us know when you establish one. <laughs> we will come to visit. Uh, and uh, Frank, going to your questions uh, around um, moving organizations from hierarchy into cells, maybe you can, you know, like higher, like, I don't know if it's, you know, maybe we can say a few words about this cells, uh, like um, structure. I don't know if everybody know how higher works. Uh, and there was uh, another question uh, from your side about um, uh, roles and competences. Yeah, what is the different the the difference between role based and competence based? Uh, yeah. so. We make <clears throat> going to the first thing about higher. We make. Uh, our way of seeing it. I don't say this is uh, the right one, but this was part of our work to separate the companies that we say, okay, they are very progressive because they really do things in a completely different way. They are challenging whatever we are learning until now. And there are the other people that we say, okay, they really have a kind of systemic approach when they consider all the steps and everything. And all the different uh, areas that we see about in, in this DP model. If I think about higher, I think there are a lot, lot of things that they are not at. They have a very progressive way of uh, organizing and doing things, but um, according to us, it is not teal, and that is not what something that we could say that this is a true self-organizing. Uh, it is more like a kind of a market that you need to fight for whatever it is. And you are not thinking about the whole organization because it is not an organization. It is a network organization that it is composed of many, many different um, smaller companies. Some of them are big. And when there is an, um, a question for doing something, a product or getting something, people inside, they are competing to each other. In this competition, someone is the uh, winner and uh, the others might be the losers. And in some cases, they lose too much that they go bankrupt. So uh, for us, this is not uh, really the, the meaning of 
teal in the way that how we collaborate, how we do things together. If we consider the part that uh, when we were talking about um, finances, then we say that there we need to consider from where is the capital coming? Who, who, who are the people we want to do business with? Who are the people that are putting things? And then there is the other part, the one that have to do with this social responsibility and um, sustainability. And we don't see that those things in higher are something that we could give them like a kind of, okay, they are teal or in the way of being teal. No, they are just progressive. They have found that different, some kind of very progressive kind of aggressive way of doing business. And the other part of the question was? How to organize instead of hierarchies. Yeah, then you can take that. Yeah, the other part was about roles and competences. No, I think the first, the first one was also organizing. Yes, the example of a hierarchy. Instead of hierarchy, the problem with hierarchies is, is that static hierarchies, and they are very static. The traditional hierarchies of power. It's not a problem with hierarchies. It's a problem is to have power and status in the levels. And they, will, they have a tendency to be very static. And then they have a fast moving world around us that cannot adapt to that. What can we do instead? A dynamic organization is more like based on circles or something that is dynamic that you you start those circles when they are needed and not needed you close them but we don't fire people because we don't have a static hierarchy we have a dynamic organization so people are needed in the organization but they are needed where we need to do a job at the moment so we need now we have a problem here we start a circle for that who do we need to do to to be efficient in that way? We need those people. Sociocracy is a good governance system for doing that. So, so, sociocracy is good in organizing how to organize and how to make decisions. So that could be a, a way to support to build up the kind of, of uh, organization. Um, so that is is a way of doing that. And the other. Uh, he, uh, and, and sociocracy is still a part of hierarchical. It's a structure, but my mobile phone is also a structure. It's a product structure that you can you can break it down in pieces. So it's not the hierarchy is not a problem. It's a power and uh, and uh, status in the levels, <laughs> and that you earn more money in the in the levels. Uh, the second question about competence and role based. Role is, um, you have to define a role. Uh, positions uh, are dangerous because they are in the hierarchy. Um, roles, if more like Rolf can have different roles in different situations where my competence has a value. Um, yeah, the, the example we have in the book regarding that, it is from Holma Folkhögskola. And uh, we have uh, also making the whole drawing how the, the school is organized in this way. And the example is, for example, um, Andreas, that is the headmaster, is the headmaster that also shows up how you need, whatever an organization is, you need to be part of the society. And here you need to have somebody that is the headmaster. But in these different circles that they are organized, in some of them, he is there because he is a biologist and he is contributing with his knowledge about that. In other of those uh, circles, he is there just as one member that just need to do a work, whatever work is needed. And uh, in some others, it is there more like in his position as a teacher. I mean, it is one person that can have several roles depending if which one of these uh, circles or team, if you want to say, uh, he belongs to. Uh, and that is really very well explained. It's one of the cases that we have gone very deeply and is considered also one of the best implementations of sociocracy see, that we have in Europe. Yeah, and and also to say that how do I, in a competence-based organization, I contribute with my competence not in my position. For instance, if I'm sitting in a management team as a logistics manager, I'm not contributing in my role, just try to 
take to defend my logistics department, I'm contributing with my companies because I maybe I know something about IT or finances as well. You have to have this culture that I'm contributing what I know. Then you're becoming a team. Then you are growing as a team. So that is also one of the principles about, about a competence-based organization, the contribution. But the need, you need to have a culture that allow that, allow me to contribute with my competence. So I'm not stepping into the finance manager's part because I'm a finance manager. The logistics manager does nothing about my part because, so that is a, a different way of looking at it. Having these roles and positions also sometimes is very connected to what is the next topic nowadays when we want to talk more deeply in this, the people part of the things and this uh, psychological safety. Because when there is no this psychological safety in the organizations, there is also a tendency to have the role as a kind of a mask. That is what gives me the authority and the position of doing something. Otherwise, I don't dare uh, how to act. So maybe we can go on to that. Yes, yes, let's do it. Let's dive into this um, mm. uh, discussion around the first chapter of your book. And so we can start with the model you prepared for us for our discussion. Absolutely. Uh, we can see that. Sometimes cyclical safety has become some kind of fluffy buzzword. Uh, I'm talking about cyclical safety. Um, but if you try to make it concrete, it's very important. And uh, also if it is needed, if you want to utilize the, the organization's full potential. Surprisingly, it's not coined by Amy Emerson. It was actually coined as early as 1965 that two guys called Vera Bennis and Elia Shan. So this is, and, and you see that was to change an organization uh, towards a less bureaucratic culture, the need to have people that feel safe in the organization. And then Amy Emerson have a huge resource project at Google. There she also, since then, been very active in uh, discussion so of safety in a very fantastic way. Um, what we will do, we've tried to explain a Clark's model from 2020, because it, I think this is a really good model that is easy to understand and easy to take in. And I will try to just go through it by sharing it. There are four stages that uh, Clark defines. The first is inclusion safety, like feeling accepted and involved in a social context. It's like, if I can just be there in the in the organization or in the team, uh, I can speak and uh, like to feel confident and uh, yeah, I feel good, no fear, not be excluded, I feel included. Um, the second step is like, feeling safe and being able to learn and develop, like, can I ask questions? Do I dare to ask a question? Maybe to think if I ask the wrong question, do they, do they think I'm stupid? And to feel this thing that I can ask a question, I can give or receive the feedback in a good way, in a positive way, uh, feed forward that we are proposing. Um, I can take, I can make mistakes, allowed to make mistakes. Ingvar Kamper, the founder of IKEA, said that the only the only people who are sleeping are not making mistakes. Um, we have to be not feeling stupid. The next stage is how can you contribute and make a difference? Uh, back to what we discussed a couple of minutes ago, can I contribute with my competence, my skills, my abilities? To add value, um, but, and also people want me to contribute, so we feel that safetyness in the organization. And the last stage is feeling safe to make things better. 
Um, can we challenge the way of working? Can we discuss that openly? There is no consequence. If I said we, the way we are working now, it will not work. It will be a problem. We can do it another way. And then I don't have a, I don't have consequences for that to say no. I will be put aside or something like that. So have this. There is a really sincerity. Then we came to a stage where we can be work very innovative, be very creative. That was actually Amy Edmondson's um, resource question at Google. How can we distinguish innovative or creative teams? How can we move to this fourth stage of psychological safety? And Alicia, the questions that we are going to work with today, shall I? You have them? Or shall I show them? You, you can show them. Okay. Yeah, that'd be good. We have two two different questions. We will see if we, we will have the time to go through both of them. The first one is, is really thinking about one particular situation and really not being general, being as concrete as possible. Uh, where you have um, experiment a lack of at least one of these four stages and try to explain and discuss with each other how this uh, situation had uh, have an impact on you. And when I say on you, it is on you as a person affecting your capacity to feel better, this whatever has to do with well-being and this thing, but also your capacity of delivering a better work or your capacity to develop in your work or whatever. It is really a complete impact in different uh, ways of whatever constitute yourself. So I think this will be the first one. We can start uh, to discuss the, in the different breakout rooms. 